uh, we will get into our talk, but first, uh, I would just like to quickly thank our sponsors, Seamless Technology Partnership, TPP, Define, Jane Street, CGG, and Riverlane. And speaking of Riverlane, our speaker knows uh, a thing or two about Riverlane since she is the vice president of the, the chief product officer at Riverlane, Leona Mjok, who who is giving the talk today on how to turn a quantum computer into a product. And without further ado, uh, I will pass it over to our speaker. Thank you so much, Julian, and uh, thanks again for the invitation. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I hope I can uh, give you some glimpse of, uh, of what the work we're doing at Riverlane on quantum computing and kind of my take on the, on the subject today. I'm gonna share my screen now and then double check that it's all working before mm -hmm, I... Of course. And perfect. Can you see the actual screen and not the presenter screen? Yes, yes, yeah. full screen. Lovely. Um, so yeah, I, I want to talk today about how to turn a quantum computer into a product. Um, and what is a product even, or what's important uh, for a good product, right? If you ask uh, product demigod Marty Kagan, uh, one of the people that you know is, was fundamental to the discipline of product management, has written the most um, uh, read, well-read books on the topic. A, a product, um, it can be, or a good product can be summarized in this formula. And now you're all physicists, so I'm sure you find business philosophies written down as formulas a bit weird and potentially even slightly irritating because like, what's even the units here, right? But anyway, it's a pretty good shorthand for how you can approach defining testing and building a product, right? Um, a product is an object, material, or immaterial that makes a good number of users happy by fulfilling a previously unmet need. Um, however, while the user is sort of the center of the product and product thinking, delighting a user will always be constrained by the technology. A teleportation device is, uh, is you know, a product that probably would find a lot of users, but impossible to make from, from the technology side of things. And the other constraint that we always have to consider is how the product would be commercialized. What are the business uh, constraints that I'm working under? How much would it cost? And how much would you have to charge? Um, nowadays, every startup company, Revelane included, wants to be a product company, right? Because uh, in particular, a software product company, software is really fiendishly hard to build. But once you've built it um, and you can make lots of users happy, uh, you have high margins. It's very easy to distribute um, and you can delight a lot of users um, at the same time. So, but what does that really, really mean for quantum computers? And uh, so in this talk, I'll attempt uh, to explain um, and give you a flavor for how this formula is being applied to quantum computers. I'll first speak about potential users of quantum computers, namely computational chemists. And then I'll uh, explain some of the technology constraints that we're currently working under, under the status of the technology. I'll go back to the users and explain what they might attempt to do with a quantum computer. And finally, I'll briefly touch on the business. Uh, what does it currently mean to commercialize quantum computers? What's the ecosystem like, etc. So without further ado, the users, computational chemists. Uh, and I want to, to take you back to my undergrad, <laughs> uh, which, um, which was, uh, so I'm a chemist by training um, and I studied in Germany. Germans are very, very proud of uh, having a very thorough, practical, experimental chemistry education. So a lot of that time was um, spent in the lab during my undergrad. And uh, so this story is about one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had in the lab. And this uh, molecule that you can see here is called lolimalide. Um, it is a natural product um, that at some point was conjectured to have, uh, you know, uh, um, to be potentially a, an anti-cancer drug. Um, um, and so there's a big, it was a big interest from synthetic organic chemistry to be able to synthesize this molecule. 
And during my undergrad in 2006, I was assigned to a PhD student who was trying to do exactly that. And I was tasked with doing one of the very simple reactions, uh, namely starting with this ring and doing a very simple substitution reaction to get some of these, um, some of these fragments here added to this, to this ring. And it, it should have been totally bog standard, bog standard substitution reaction, and it just did not work. It did not work. Um, so um, something unexpected about the structure or this particular molecule made it impossible. There were maybe steric effects that we didn't quite understand, um, but who could really tell? So after weeks of experimenting with temperature and reaction time and reactants and solvents, I got a tiny, tiny bit of this desired product. And um, so my biggest wish from this most frustrating exper experience from my undergrad was that I, that I wanted to have a giant magnifying glass that would just allow me to look into my flask and see exactly what's going on in it. Fewer people than the mic to into. Okay. <laughs> if there's any questions, please unmute yourself. Um, so after that experience, I actually decided to become a computational chemist rather than an experimental chemist because it was so traumatizing. And in that process, I learned that actually these giant magnifying glasses for chemistry exist. They're called computers, right? Um, because uh, electrons, the particles that determine chemical reactivity and behavior, are quantum mechanical and we know how they behave. It's described by the Schrodinger equation. Um, the Schrodinger equation, in fact, predicts the whole periodic system. It predicts everything that might happen in a molecule. Um, quantum mechanics is an incredibly successful theory, right? It can predict uh, chemical phenomena like the geometry of a molecule, the transition state during a reaction, a spectrum or a crystal structure. Um, alas, it's not possible to solve the Schrodinger equation by brute force for almost all cases. The famous many body problem, what messes you up is the electron-electron interaction term here. And we can solve it for one electron system like the hydrogen atoms, I'm, and I'm sure lots of you will have done that. Um, so in your quantum mechanics course, but that's, that's sort of it. We can't do many electron systems just straight from this equation. So how uh, computers solve this problem, um, this is uh, the general idea of how they usually do it. Um, it's called Hartree-Fock theory. It's quite old. It was invented in the late 1920s, but really only took off when we had digital computers because it's really quite complicated to do this by hand. So what we do in, the, in Hartree Fock theory is that we first invoke the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, um, which says that because electrons move so fast, so much faster than the nuclei of the atoms, uh, uh, nuclei, we can assume the nuclei to be static. And then we write this many electron wave function as a single determinant, a so-called Slater determinant. It's important that it has this form of a determinant because electrons are fermions and you need anti-symmetry. You need um, the wave function to change sign when you exchange two electrons. You then typically work in a basis set, um, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a set of functions that um, you can combine. So they describe your one electron um, wave functions uh, well. And these one electron wave functions are typically called orbitals. And then you use a variational method to solve for orbitals that minimize the energy. This is a, an iterative procedure. Um, in other words, you, you look at each electron at, um, in terms of how it interacts with an average charge of all the other el electrons. It's sort of like a, a mean field theory. Um, and I thought um, it might be interesting for people from Cambridge uh, to, to see this um, uh, to this point that this only took off in the 1950s when we had digital computers. This is a, a quite an early um, publication that I found um, where, where that actually went a bit beyond um, Hartree Fock theory, but it was done on the ETSAC, um, which was um, one of the first um, Van Neumann architecture 
computers ever built and it was built here in Cambridge by Maurice Wilkes and and others um so yeah this uh, this is uh, this is a great example of of you know this sort of theory this sort of computation and this sort of way of thinking about chemistry really taking off when we had computers so there are various um approximations uh, and that I make in Hartree Fock theory. And the most important one is that I just assume that I have one single electron, a uh, single, I'm sorry, determinant to uh, represent my wave function. Um, if we consider all the possible states, there are lots of options of how, how I can distribute my electrons here in my orbitals, right? But I am only considering one of these possibilities, the ground state. Um, but in reality, um, these sorts of higher excitations, they mix in a bit, right? The actual exact solution is sort of this plus small uh, amounts of excitations. I need to give the electrons more room, if you will, more degrees of freedom so I can uh, um, converge towards the correct solution. So if I consider how many possibilities there are of, um, of distributing electrons in orbitals, there is an exponential number of possible states. Um, and when we, we consider all of these states, um, the solution is called full configuration interaction. And this full con configuration uh, interaction then scales exponentially with the system size, but it is in principle the exact solution to, the heart rate, uh, to, to this problem. We're making a couple of other approximations like the Born Oppenheim approximations, and we're also considering that this is a non-relativistic -rel uh, equation, et cetera, et cetera, but, but, but um, let, let's neglect those for, this, for a second, right? So um, considering all of these possibilities of distributing the electrons in my orbitals gets me to the exact solution, uh, apart from these other approximations that I make, but it comes at a very, very high cost. It scales horribly, and I can only ever calculate very, very small systems. Um, so, Hartree-Fock theory isn't always accurate. Full CI is usually not practical. Where did this discipline called theoretical chemistry even, how did that come about? So what theoretical chemists have been doing in the last 70 years is inventing a whole forest of methods that go beyond Hartree Fock theory, um, but that, that give a better kind of trade off between computational cost and predictive power. Um, the biggest success story in quantum mechanical method development is probably density functional theory uh, here, which happens uh, to hit a, a sweet spot between kind of computational scaling and accuracy. In density functional theory, we don't solve the Schrodinger equation directly, we sort of reformulate the, the, the problem. Um, we don't work with a wave function, we work with the electron density instead. And then we fit certain empirical parameters. Um, but armed with these sorts of approximations, we can really um, determine geometries to, to a pretty good accuracy, you know, like to an accuracy that allows us to, you know, to make some, to make some chemical conclusions. We can predict spectra. <laughs> this happens to be a spectrum from my, from my own thesis, a rotational, rotational spectrum. Um, and we can also uh, predict transition states and reaction kinetics. This would have been very, very important um, in that problem that I had with my lolly malide uh, natural compound synthesis. But unfortunately, um, while we've seen so much progress in the last decade, especially with computer power exploding as well, um, this progress is coming to a halt a bit. And it's not only that, you know, Moore's law is coming to an end and we're not seeing computer power um, expanding as, uh, you know, increasing as quickly anymore. It's also that it seems like we've exhausted um, the, the, the method development arsenal a bit. Since the invention of DFT and certain versions of DFT, there hasn't been that much progress in really finding good methods that give you a good computational cost predictive power trade-off. So as it stands today, when I go back to my giant, you know, magnifying glass analogy, quantum co uh, uh, regular computers, not quantum computers, regular computers are imperfect magnifying glasses of chemistry. And they can either give you a very crisp view of a very, very small part of the reaction, um, 
for example, how one solvent molecule behaves, or you can zoom out and show the full picture and simulate all the solvents and all the reactants, but everything is a bit blurry and out of focus. Okay, so enter quantum computers, right? These are these amazing apparatuses that are promising to be a step change in computational chemistry. Um, the hand wavy explanation for this is that they're quantum uh, systems themselves, so they can represent electrons and molecules with much greater ease than a regular uh, computer. And um, that is the reason that, uh, you know, while on classical computers calculating the exact solution to the Schrodinger equation scales exponentially in system size, on a quantum computer, the scaling is linear. Um, so the, the inner workings of a quantum uh, of a quantum computer are absolutely fundamentally different from your regular laptop. In your laptop, you have a CPU and that's your workhorse and it executes all the programs that you have. And um, it's filled with these transistors, right? So these semiconductor devices that can be on or off corresponding to a one or a zero. Um, and these then form NAND gates and the NAND gates, they form their whole architecture. Uh, quantum computers, on the other hand, are based on qubits, and um, qubits are constructed from two-level um, quantum systems corresponding to the bits of a regular computer. Um, but using advanced experimental techniques, you can also produce linear combinations of these states. Um, somehow there's a formula missing. Anyway, you can you can uh, produce. Um, you can produce these superpositions of these states that are often represented on a sphere, the so-called Bloch sphere. You can see the zero and the one, and then it can be any super any any state in between, if you will. Um, now imagine you have a system of many qubits, let's say M, and each qubit has a coefficient corresponding to the probability of finding the state in zero or in one. And this means that there are two M possibilities of different combinations of zeros and one that you need to consider. And fundamentally, this is what gives quantum computers their power. You can consider basically two to the M possibilities at once, right? Um, the problem um, with quantum, any quantum system, however, is that in order to extract any information from it, I need to observe it, right? I need to measure it. And this measurement thing often trips you up. So, you know, I'm sure from your quantum mechanics course, you may remember this, this poor, uh, this, this poor cat, Schrödinger's poor cat, that's dead and alive at the same time before you open the box and measure. And then when you, when you open the box, you know, you know, it's definite fate. And the same happens in quantum computers. We are in a state of endless possibilities before we measure, but as soon as we open the box, figuratively speaking, the state collapses into just one of the many possibilities. And that is fundamentally the reason that harnessing the power of quantum computers is actually sort of really, really difficult because we need to figure out how to extract information without just collapsing everything into a random state. Um, so very, very clever mathematicians and physicists have succeeded, however, in designing algorithms that do exactly that, that use this, this wonderful property uh, 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 that quantum computers have of being in so many states at the same time and being able to extract information from it. Um, but this is really, really hard to do. Um, and there are only a finite number of quantum algorithms that give you a so-called quantum speed up that give you any uh, advantage over, over classical computers. There, and not all uh, speed ups are made the same. Um, there are speed ups, uh, there, there are algorithms that give you an exponential speed up compared to your classical computer. Um, for example, the famous Shor's algorithm that is uh, that with which you can do prime number factoring. Um, and then also quantum chemical simulations. There are um, algorithms that give you a square root speed up, for example, uh, Grover's search. And then there are specific algorithms that give you, you know, well, we're not quite sure what speed up exactly. It's kind of heuristic, for example, specific optimization algorithms and quantum machine learning. Well, this is really good news for all the quantum chemists then, right? So let me explain a bit more why um, why does quantum chemistry scale so much better on a quantum computer? So we'll go back to your water molecule and the electrons in your orbitals. 
So um, let's assume you have m orbitals and n electrons, right? So the way we can um, represent this wave function now is we don't have to do it um, by, you know, summing up over all the terms that we have and considering all the different ways of distributing these electrons in these orbitals. We can simply um, prepare this as a superposition of these different types of distributions of electrons and orbitals that we have. And this means that we can encode this type of state in, in a register of m qubits rather than the, the, the two to the m qubits that we would need classically. That's pretty amazing. Um, so how do quantum computers look today? Um, there are various different physical implementations of qubits that are in the race to sort of become the transistor of quantum computers. And um, we currently, or I currently, don't know which one's going to win out. Um, uh, um, you can ask me about my opinion, but I'll, I'll be Switzerland in that, in that regard. I really don't know. Um, and there's, there's great things happening in all of these technologies. So, um, for example, you can use atoms, neutral atoms or trapped ions, so, so charged atoms, and you can make basically these two level systems out of them that you can then manipulate to be in superpositions, etc. You can use um, superconducting um, qubits or superconducting systems. They are mesoscopic systems in which this two level quantum system that you need is formed by both Einstein condensate of Cooper pairs. Um, these Cooper pairs are the pairs of electrons that are bound together in superconductors. Um, superconducting and um, sort of uh, atomic qubits are currently considered the most advanced, although photons are also uh, really, you know, in the race and catching up. Um, there have actually been two instances in which quantum computers have outperformed conventional computers at very specific tasks. One um, is a famous experiment by Google AI, by the Google AI group with 53 qubits working with superconducting qubits. And then there's another um, one with a slightly, a very specific task that's a bit different from the quantum computing we're talking here. But anyway, it's called boson sampling and that was done with photons. Um, but anyway, no matter the specific implementations, qubits are really fickle objects. The slightest contact with the classical world destroys their quantum nature. This is a process of decoherence. And basically, the system loses its ability to be in a superposition of states and simply is flat out boring and classical. And that obviously destroys any quantum computation that you may have uh, done or that may be in process. Oopa, sorry. <laughs> So uh, you may have asked yourself, actually, looking at these pictures of these different labs with different types of um, uh, quantum uh, computers, what are all those boxes in those labs uh, doing there? Why do I, what do I need all of that for? And the answer is that this is basically the life support of a qubit, the life support system of a qubit that keeps it in uh, from decohering, right? We need complicated control system consisting of, of analog control units like lasers and waveform generators. Then we have um, fast programmable elements like FPGAs. Um, and then we also have lab computers and all of these have to work together to keep the quantum computer uh, from decohering or the qu qubits from, for de from decohering, extending the lifetimes of the qubits so the, that we can actually run long calculations on them. So, and even further than that, we, we actually need a process called quantum error correction in the long run, um, so we can extend the lifetime of the qubits. So, um, the, in, in quantum error correction, what happens is that the same information gets encoded in qubits multiple times, you know, redundantly. Um, so that um, you you can then check whether any of these qubits have decohered and then correct the error. Quantum mechanics make, makes this error monitoring really, really hard, rather complicated again, because if you measure, you destroy your state. So how do you look up whether an error occurred if then everything, you know, just gets destroyed if you look it up. So you need very, very clever layouts. And um, here's an example layout of how you do this. 
Um, these are called codes, essentially. This is a very specific code called the Steam code. And then you need tons of ancillary qubits that allow you to then measure when, whether any of these um, qubits here has decohered. And this is um, really quite difficult to do, especially if you have a computation running and you need to check during your computation whether anything has decohered. So, um, and the result of that is that you need thousands and thousands of qubits, of physical qubits, to present represent one logical qubit, right? So um, what you then do is you have your data qubits and you have your ancillary qubits, and you know you imagine there's some noise. You do something called a syndrome generation. Then um, you you do a syndrome measurement. You measure your syndrome. You decode this error, so you actually check whether there was an error, and then you. Uh, you do an error you do the error correction if this uh, error occurred and then you correct the data qubit and all of this has to happen incredibly fast um in microseconds for atomic qubits and nanoseconds for superconducting qubits in superconducting qubits you have the additional problem that these superconductors have to be kept at very 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 low temperatures you have to do it in the fridge this is all really 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 quite difficult so your heart i'm sure must be sinking right now you know if we have if we need thousands of qubits to enable error correction and have 53 sort of sort of working qubits right now in this google ai experiment um so how the hell are we ever going to use a quantum computer as like a true magnifying glass for chemistry this just all sounds like a pipe dream so um, while constructing a fully error corrected quantum computer is really, really difficult um, and the billion dollar task that the industry is facing today, right? Um, there, um, that, that's definitely what, what we're aiming at. Um, so the thing that makes us makes me sort of optimistic that we will we will get there eventually is that there's sort of like a quantum Moore's law. So in the last decade, we've seen a yearly doubling of quantum computing power um, as measured by how many qubits can be built um, combined with how noisy they are. And there's another piece of good news. Um, we won't necessarily need a fully error corrected quantum computer to do useful things. We can maybe use so called noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC devices, NISC with a Q. Um, and those are already under construction. So in chemistry, um, there are two main algorithms which you can use to compute chemical properties. Um, and both of them can be used to solve the Schrodinger equation. And one of them is NISC and one of them isn't. So let me let me briefly take you through these two, um, two algorithms. So the first um, is called quantum phase estimation, and that was also historically invented first. And in this algorithm, we directly encode the physical description of the system into the quantum computer and then perform a series of manipulations to extract information about the energy as we measure. Um, quantum phase estimation is based on the quantum Fourier transform. Um, this is the quantum analog of the fast Fourier transform. Um, and this is actually also um, the, the sort of subroutine that makes factoring integers so fast. And this quantum Fourier transform can be used to estimate the phase of a state. And that's equivalent to solving an eigenvalue equation basically here for the energy. In other words, it can be exploited to calculate the spectrum of a Hamiltonian. So you to run this algorithm, you need two types of qubits, ones in which you load the state you want to study, and ones another set um, on which you then eventually write the state of the binary. And you generally don't know what the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is, so you have to guess a little um, because your initial input needs some overlap um, with, with, your, with, um, um, with your actual answer. And then you, you prepare a superposition of all of these states, perform this quantum Fourier transform, um, you get an entangled state between your original state and the energies of each component, and then you measure these qubits. Um, by the measurement postulate of quantum mechanics, this gives you kind of a spectral energy as a readout. Um, and there you go. Um, this is really the best algorithm for determining the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. 
but it requires a very, very long quantum circuit. So this thing that I just call here quantum Fourier transform, this is actually a lot of operations where you pick up bits of the phase. Um, and um, so it will be very, very hard to implement this in, in so-called NISC devices because the qubits we currently have, they are not long lived enough. We really need error corrected qubits to do this properly. So there are, however, algorithms that, that are really quite promising for these near-term machines. And one of these is the variational quantum eigensolver. And this is a hybrid algorithm in which you basically just outsource the hardest bit, the bit that's hardest on a conventional computer to the quantum computer. So this algorithm is based on the variational principle um, in the same way that you know, the Hartree-Fock theory is based on the variational principle. And uh, we choose a reference state, uh, for example, the, the Hartree-Fock state, uh, and this Hartree-Fock state has a set of parameters, and then we prepare it on the quantum computer. We, we run a circuit to prepare the state that depends on these parameters. We measure. Um, we do this a couple of times because all of this is a bit probabilistic and we, need a, we, need to, um, we want to get to a certain accuracy. Um, then we evaluate the energy by just calculating this, this uh, uh, this uh, solving the eigenvalue equation. And then we, we put uh, the result back, uh, and we do this on the classical computer, then we put the result back, um, choose a new set of, of these parameters theta, and do the same thing again. So this is a quite a good algorithm to use um, on your turn devices, because the quantum resources that you use are only to prepare the state and then measure the energy. So it does not uh, need exceedingly long coherence times. Um, the main advantage, obviously, to classical systems is that um, this, the, this, uh, these quantum registers can store exponentially more states compared to the classical memory, right? So in this variational quantum eigensolver compared to the quantum phase estimation, we have substituted a long series of manipulations for shorter series of, me of uh, measurement um, performed um, many times. And uh, we can use a device with a relatively short qubit lifetime to perform a chemistry calculation. Um, so in theory, both of the variation, both the variation quantum eigensolver and quantum phase estimation uh, have, have been claimed to deliver exponential quantum speed up compared to conventional quantum chemistry. But for the variational quantum eigensolver, it, this whole thing is a bit tricky to estimate because um, you don't only have this quantum routine, you also have this, this, um, this classical optimizer. And we don't really know what the errors are in the system. How many times do I have to prepare and measure, um, depending on you know, how noisy the system is? How far off the actual solution do we start? And how will our classical optimizer that we use here perform? Um, so, so this is actually, uh, quite hard to estimate how exactly this will perform on an actual quantum device. And just to say that there are various results on how to combine the merits of quantum phase estimation with the variational quantum eigensolver. Um, so we can use, you know, qubit lifetimes, uh, coherence times, um, optimally as they get longer. Um, okay, after this bird's eye view of where the tech is in quantum computing, um, let me go back to the user, the chemist, and explain how they might make use of quantum computers, right? So if I go back to my, my horrible, frustrating experience of lolly malide, um, you know, how would I have tried to solve this on a conventional computer? I would have likely um, turn to density functional theory, which I which I mentioned before, which is kind of the workhorse of, of computational chemistry today, right? Um, density functional theory provides um, sufficient geometries for organic molecules, sufficiently accurate um, geometries for organic molecules, so I can get some insights into sterical uh, effects, steric effects, and participating solvent molecules. I drew some some water here as solvent molecules. I, I don't think I used water for lolimolite. I think I used some organic solvent, but uh, but you get the principle. So um, in this magnifying glass analogy that I used at the beginning, so this density functional theory is a method that gives you sort of a medium wide view and just about acceptable focus, right? Um, you get you get a pretty good idea as to what happens in your chemical system if you know what you're looking for and if you know 
what the approximations exactly are that you're making and you can get a good good intuition good feel for it right however and and so this would have got me good transition states and geometries so probably a pretty good idea about the mechanism however you know in any reaction chemical reaction something that is quite important is bond breaking and bond making right i stretch bonds and then you know molecules fall apart or they form and in this bond breaking and bond making um process what happens is that i have um that i have uh, that i uh, arrive at states that are very very close in energy or degenerate states or quasi degenerate states and these are really quite hard to tackle on a classical computer dft absolutely completely fails so the types of methods i would have likely turned to on a conventional computer are multi-configurational uh, scf so this is kind of like a a, a way of extending hartree fock theory by uh, considering two um, slater determiners and optimizing the orbitals for both separately or I would have used so-called couple cluster theory, which is a bit the gold standard in terms of accuracy for quantum computing, uh, for, for regular computing, sorry. So um, couple cluster theory is usually used to obtain really quantitatively accurate results for geometries or reaction energies, but I can't use it beyond, say, 30 atoms or so. So to, to, to look at this whole lolly malide molecule couple cluster theory would not have been uh, practical because it would have it would have not been possible to calculate this on a on a conventional uh, computer. This would have been too expensive. So um, from that analysis, what what uh, I what what I think quantum computers will be will will sort of catch up with first, right in the NISC era. So they will have to um, calculate, they will, they will have to only be able to calculate relatively small molecules. So these, these small quantum computers need to be able to compete with relatively highly accurate methods, such as couple cluster theory. And the first hurdle to clear is the accurate description of small molecules and reactions for which even couple cluster theory fails. For example, these multi-reference methods. Um, nowadays, people are fairly confident that with a couple of hundred qubits with like really decent lifetimes, like really good coherence times, we could potentially beat a conventional um, uh, quantum chemistry computation. Um, but this is still an open question. But now you have to consider what happens if the quantum version of Moore's law holds, right? So imagine you can do you can do very small molecules to a very high accuracy. You have all the methods. You have good good qubit lifetimes, etc. So um, so and then then uh, quantum computing power doubles um, every year, right? If that still holds, that means that within three years we will have increased our computing power like sixteen fold, and we will be able to kind of take our magnifying glass that's super super crisp right for a small region and just extend it and expand it so zoom out and the view that we have of our molecule and our reaction uh, will still be super crisp we will have the ability to calculate large um, systems large um, chemical systems to a very very high accuracy and then it won't take long until we have enough qubits to do, properly do error correction and re run really long computations. So um, let me explain how this might play out in a very, very specific area of where computational chemistry today plays a role in industry, um, in drug discovery. Um, and obviously this is speculation because we don't really know how this is going to play out, but, um, but still, let me make the case. Um, in drug discovery, you're you're usually interested in how a specific drug interacts with an enzyme, right? That's that's what you want to look at. So here um, we have an enzyme. It's it's um, a metallobetalactamase, and um, metallobetalactamase are pretty evil enzymes because they destroy uh, carbapenems, which are antibiotics of last resort. Um, so this this um, beta lactamase, the the one that I show here, has a zinc atom. That's the gray blob that you see here in the middle, um, and 
so the big question here, the big scientific question that we need to answer in order to understand how we could keep beta lactamases from destroying these carbapenems um, is what is exactly the mechanism as to how these carbapenems get destroyed. So um, when, when answering this question um, with, with uh, conventional methods, you have to fight with a lot of computational challenge, challenges that are very hard, namely bond breaking and bond making, because we're uh, talking about a mechanism. But then uh, we also have a metallo enzyme here. So we have a metal in the center. And um, this metal um, has uh, or anything with kind of a transition metal or a metal inside has, again, these degenerate states. So lots of uh, states that are very close in energy. So many of the traditional methods that you would use, they break down. So um, enzymes are really, really rather big molecules. So the way you would treat them on a classical computer is that you would splice them up into regions, as I kind of have shown here. And then you would, um, you would only treat the most important region with a very, very highly accurate method and sort of gradually get less accurate in terms of your methods as you go out and, and go away from the center. Um, this is called embedding generally. And what you can imagine is that um, once quantum computers uh, are able to do so, that you will simply be able to, to calculate the most important region on the quantum computer, then you go out a tiny bit, right, to, to a less important region, you would calculate that with a fairly high, high accurate method on a classical computer, and so on and so forth. And as quantum computers increase in size and quality, you will be able to expand this region in the middle, right? Okay, um, let me now come to the to the very last bit of my talk, which is um, what's the what's the landscape like at the moment? What what are we doing in terms of commercializing quantum computers? So much wiser people than me and much better informed people than me have have uh, thought about this in depth, um, including uh, the Boston Consulting Group and a now, in a now almost infamous report. Um, they came up with some numbers as to what they think the quantum computing market will be worth when. And so they predict that in the NISC era, so in the next three to five years ish, um, the quantum quantum computing market will be worth $500 million um, for the materials industry annually and $600 million in the pharma industry. And this sounds like a lot, uh, right? But then consider what they are predicting for fault tolerant quantum computing, $55 billion uh, for the materials industry and $75 billion um, dollars annually for the pharma industry. So this is really the, the opportunity that complex quantum computing brings. And even if these, these numbers turn out to be a bit too high, which you know they potentially will, th these, are, these are huge opportunities that we're looking at. So this is no surprise then that the quantum ecosystem, the quantum computing ecosystem is thriving. Since 2012, there's been $1.5 billion um, dollars in private investment into quantum tech startups. The number of hardware startups has been exploding, uh, the number of com quantum computing hardware startups in the last couple of years. Um, this is um, kind of a little map um, that um, uh, um, an online publication called Sifted made of quantum computing uh, and quantum tech startups in Europe. And you can see it's quite crowded. Riverlane's over there. Um, the UK is doing very well, but there's uh, there's all sorts of activity going on in, um, in Europe. So given that sort of funding situation, given the state of the technology, given that we have, uh, that, that there's such a great use case for quantum computers in quantum chemistry. Um, I am fairly confident that um, by sort of 2050 or so, um, an organic uh, chemistry student will be able to use a quantum computer to get more than just blurry insights into what their reaction is. Uh, and why it is not working. <laughs> and I, in fact, think that um, the advent of quantum computers could make computational chemistry so central to gaining chemical understanding 
that it will be the first topic that chemistry students learn rather than you know one that comes like way later in their education or nothing at all and of course chemical rules and knowledge will be by no means obsolete we still must know how to ask the right questions and devise sensible hypotheses etc but testing them will be less much less laborious and painful once we have quantum computers if you'll indulge me for five more minutes i'll talk briefly about what riverlane's role is in in this whole quantum ecosystem and in this whole sort of space that i that i that i described for you um, so one thing we do at Riverlane is we work on uh, quantum chemistry algorithms um, because quantum hardware increases will not happen in a vacuum. Um, through better software and algorithms, we can understand how we can use available hardware more efficiently. Um, and in this figure, you can you can sort of see how through software and algorithm developments, the size of the uh, of a necessary uh, quantum computer to do something useful has decreased just by itself without any hardware development, right? And, uh, you know, software development and algorithm development is usually cheaper than hardware development. So that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good deal. Um, and so we work on various aspects of this, um, better methods to prepare chemically relevant states, methods, oops, sorry, methods to measure the, uh, the energy more efficiently, uh, new fa families of chemically relevant states, um, methods to use VQE to measure spectrum of excited states, and, and many other things. The other thing we're working on is um, sort of the question of how we then efficiently run algorithms on quantum computers. Um, this picture that I showed you, I think I showed you this before, um, with this network of different types of control elements, that's actually part of how we think about writing a program onto a, this complicated life support system that that um, we have in quantum computers and this um the system that we're working on is called delta flow um, delta flow lets you write programs directly onto this control system and via a hardware abstraction layer um, you can make uh, these very very efficiently implemented algorithms portable um, across different types of qubit technology um, and we're working uh, on this on Delta Flow with almost all hardware providers in the UK. Um, and this consortium also includes ARM as well as the National Physical Laboratory. We're very proud to be working with all of these, all of these um, partners. Um, and last but not least, um, we have a couple of open jobs at Riverlane. Um, uh, we're currently looking for a DevOps and test engineer as well as a senior software tech lead. But we're also open um, to to uh, applications um, from uh, other people, in particular, if you're interested in writing software, uh, if you're interested in turning kind of research into software, contact us if you want to work for us. Um, you can find us at team at And now thank you again for the invitation and thanks everyone for your attention. I hope I could give you a bit of a flavor of what I think um, the quantum future holds and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, uh, Leonie. That was such a brilliant talk. Learned so much. Um, really interesting stuff. Uh, I really love the, uh, the story you painted there with your time as a university student and the frustration you have at um, Lillamide. Uh, I could see why you would want to make it because because I googled and the price is you know some ridiculous amount for a gram. So I could see why you could see why there's an incentive to uh to make it. Um, so I think now we'll get into uh, some questions. And obviously, you you mentioned the funny comment of you want to be Switzerland in the uh, technology department. So I'm gonna so I'm gonna question you a bit more on that. Uh, do do you have any? Like, what do you think are the kind of the key futures? What, like, like, do you have any opinions on the topics of what technology and and all that? I really don't. Um, I see so many good ideas uh, that are currently um, being explored, in particular regarding kind of scalability. Right, this is the big, <laughs> the big question. Like, uh, I don't only need like two to five atoms that I need to manipulate, but like thousands and how do I do this? And there, there are many, many great 
uh, engineering ideas that are coming up, right? So, um, so uh, yeah, I really couldn't tell. <laughs> new tool indeed, new tool indeed. Uh, on the comparisons chart with DFT and exact solution to Schrodinger uh, equation, why is the exact solution placed at lower computational cost? Uh, um, yes, because uh, this uh, was a mistake. I'm sorry, this should have been the other way around. I'm realizing now. Please apologize. Uh, exactly. <laughs> So um, let me show the slide again and then uh, clarify this for everyone. Uh, there we go. Um, so so you, here you have um, sort of uh, blah, 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 blah. the highest computational uh, cost is here and uh, the lowest computational cost is here. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, talk, clean that one up. Uh, Little question from Oscar. Um, from from the sort of uh, um, from from the understanding we have and sort of kind of environment, most of the business cases for quantum computing is still a little way off. Like we have sort of fifty qubits, but a lot of time you need quite a few qubits. So how come so many companies are entering the industry so early then? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, of course, there is a huge advantage to being to being an early mover, right? In this space mm -hmm. that is so incredibly promising, um, and sort of uh, gaining a, a um, gaining a lot of IP, right? Gaining a lot of experience, um, and um, well, we are in a very lucky situation. At least Riverlane is that we have um, you know investors that that think long term, right? They think about what might happen in ten years time rather than you know two years time or three years time. Um, but obviously, quantum computing isn't something that you know isn't something that is going to take off like super soon. <laughs> it's going, it's something for the patient uh, who is willing to solve a lot of very difficult um, technical problems. Um, the, the business case may, I, I don't think it's 20 years away. I think, um, I think we will see some early use cases much sooner. And as soon as we have the sort of general quantum advantage, even for very specific use cases, there is a business case for it. Mm, okay. Yeah. Well, that's well awesome. Thank you. Um, just uh, um, uh, another little question, uh, obviously, sort of on that uh, quantum computing is a really, really kind of deep sort of becoming technology in the future. And as you said, you know, that might be the first thing you learn as an undergrad. So what do you think currently is the best way to sort of get into the industry, uh, learn about the industry, um, any books you recommend or sort of things to play around with? Yeah, sure. Um, so one thing that I want to mention here, and sorry for the for the <laughs> ruthless advertising is we have a, a summer internship program for undergrads. Mm. <laughs> uh, unfortunately it just closed but next year there will be there will be a call for it again so please watch out for that but we're not the only ones who have that there are lots of other uh, companies that have these sorts of internship programs so that's one one good way i should um say that one company uh, that has probably done more than any other for sort of the education especially on at the undergrad level of, about quantum computing is ibm they have really amazing tools online with which you can learn um quantum computing computing um so so that's something that that anyone who's interested should uh, could uh, look into there is a the the absolute classic in terms of learning about quantum computing is the nielsen schwang and because i looked up uh, some quantum phase estimation stuff i have it here i can <laughs> oh, wait 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 <laughs> exactly. You might have it there too, Julian. Oh yeah, great. <laughs> oh, oh, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> um, and uh, there's also there's great resources online, um, especially you know from the last year as many conferences moved online, many of the talks are still on YouTube. I vividly remember that uh, there there was this amazing amazing uh, tutorial by Naomi Nickerson from SciQuantum about quantum error correction just recently and it's just on YouTube and uh, exactly um, it's it's pretty easy to find exactly 
I think quantum. Or quantum, no, no, anyway. Yes. Oh, yeah. Actually, I, I was just looking up Psy Quantum today, and they're very, they're very pro photonics. Actually, they're extremely, extremely pro photonics. Like this is the only way. So yeah. So so I mean, that's just interesting to show, like how how much the contrast are in like people are so full of technology, so not. Um, but uh, another question we have from YouTube. Um, what kind of research is being done on reducing qubit requirements? for the VQE? Um, yeah, so there's various ways of which you can which you can look at, or various kind of bottlenecks that you can look at tuning, right? One is um, the specific ansatz that you're using that you then feed <clears throat> into your quantum computer. So this is a, you, you, um, you can, for example, find hardware efficient ansatz uh, that, you know, reduce qubit count. Then another thing that people are looking at is, for example, how to make this uh, measurement more efficient. So something you can do is, for example, collect um, collect um, uh, many terms <laughs> and do measurement more efficiently. That doesn't really reduce your qubit count, but it does re re uh, reduce kind of your, your resource requirement that you need. Another um, very active um, area of research is how you can use symmetry um, to reduce, uh, again, qubit count. Um, so these are just some examples, but there's, it's a very, very active research area. So a lot, I, I'm sure I, I missed some things that are, that are currently being done. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, one of the, uh, is there any error functions in the um, Steam code, Sean code? I'm I not sure I understand the question. If the person on YouTube might uh, might want to clarify, I, I, I tried uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, There's only error functions in the Steam code. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what they're they're getting at. I mean, may, maybe they're just wanting a little bit of clarification on how the sort of scheme works, but that's probably a bit of a long question itself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a long, yeah. So there's, it's not really an error function, right? It's a way of, of defining how you can basically encode redundancies in a clever way. So you can, mm. you can then find out whether you have an, an error without destroying it exactly w without destroying your quantum state mm, mm, yeah yeah i mean from from what i was looking at it's kind of similar to having quantum hamming codes sort of what <laughs> it like. but anyway that uh, it requires a google it requires a google um, um yeah, questions at the moment as such um I'm just gonna unmute myself if that's okay because I am yeah, not a fast viper. Um, <laughs> uh, if that's okay, a super interesting talk. It's very, very, uh, very intriguing to hear an entirely different perspective. Have you tried implementing some of the novel algorithms you've developed at River Lane on NISC devices? And oh, if so. Uh -huh. <laughs> We have very good collaborators in Oxford, and we're actually currently doing exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And what what what's kind of been your experience? What what's currently the bottleneck, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting useful or interesting results? Oh um, well, it depends on how you define useful or interesting. The the quantum computer that we're currently working uh, with is is the one. Um, uh, at the Oxford University Trapped Ion Group, that's the one we're, we're collaborating most closely with at the moment, and, and it's very small. So, in terms of interesting things for for chemistry, you know, that's currently a bit limited in terms of that specific type of work that we're doing. But what we're trying to do there is um, sort of seeing how we can implement these algorithms more efficiently. So, how we can use this. Um, the well i showed you that there's various control elements right and um so the way that you can you can use kind of your qubit uh lifetime more efficiently is by introducing but by, by making use of local control by very kind of fast control that reacts to what's happening in your qubits and that's basically the kind of the line of research that we're doing there that's overcoming a very specific type of bottleneck, obviously. Mm. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um...
Uh, two seconds. Let me just get another one from YouTube. Um, um, uh, I got it up on uh, Oscar. Okay, um, amazing. Is, uh, is the work you do at River Lane uh, mainly on the business technology or the theoretical research? Um, so I'm not sure if this relates to me personally or River Lane generally. Me personally, I am. I I don't have a technical role at River Lane, so I'm chief, I'm chief product officer. My main job is to basically sort of sit at this intersection of the technology, the business, <laughs> um, and and the user, right? Uh, and see how we can how we can make quantum computing work in this sort of triangle um, of of requirements. Um, so, so my job is is non technical, but I have to understand the tech really quite well to be able to, you know, to to sit there <laughs> in the middle of it all. Um, so, so that's my job. Uh, just to say, I love product management as a discipline. It's it's really great um, because it has a technical aspect to it, and uh, but it 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 is a bit of a generalist uh, kind of job. Uh, so for me, it's just the right thing. Um, I'm not sure if. Uh, that many people here on this call, especially if they're undergrads, have heard of this discipline. Um, there's lots of resources out there where you can find out more. So just to say, if you're curious, um, that may be something to look into for what you want to do after your undergrad. Um, it's it's really great. It's a great discipline um, or great thing to do. Um, generally at River Lane, um, mostly what we do is actually not what I do. It's mostly sort of um, engineering and research. I would I would classify those uh, activities so um some of it is really just blue sky research uh, very much similar to to what you would do at a university and some of it is um, engineering because well we want to build this system called delta flow right and we want to deploy it and it should be production level code so there's um quite a big kind of software and system on chip engineering effort at revelane mm -hmm. fair enough fair enough interesting um just uh, a bit more of a personal question. So you said that you got into quantum computing mainly because the frustration you had at chemistry undergrad. <laughs> but uh, how did you go into be a chemistry undergrad, or what are like some key moments and like while wanting to go into science and all that for you? As a chemistry undergrad, before you mean before I turned before I even chose chemistry, or well, well, well. I mean, I'm I'm just wondering like what what sort of things like we like that that you really liked in chemistry and like why why you chose to do chemistry and all that and well when I when I was uh, when I was in school um in Germany I knew I wanted to do a science but I wasn't quite sure which one and chemistry seemed like a very good compromise because you could you could sort of branch into more into biology or more into physics <laughs> and I ended up branching more into physics I guess because uh, I then did theoretical chemistry for my PhD and the very very theoretical end of chemistry um exactly so uh so uh, yes uh <laughs> but this lolly malid um lolly malid uh, uh experience was definitely quite defining in making me choose theoretical chemistry <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, I can imagine, can imagine. <laughs> uh, still our questions. Um, now, do you, do you see, no, okay, so, so I guess this question is requiring you to, to, you know, be, be a, a non-Swiss, as they say. Uh, do you see a future in photonic devices, you know, uh, for example, implementing uh, the QFT in the near future for general um, quantum computers, or do you think that's more kind of fifty years or so? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I follow the question completely, but I mean, uh, photonic devices, the the ones that are currently outperforming um, traditional computers, right? They're more. They're a bit more like analog devices. They're not like general purpose devices. So I, I assume the question's about that. Um, and yeah, that is a that is a very distinct possibility. It's been shown that these sorts of sort of analogish devices have uh, a can um, can do very specific things, like for example, calculate these Frank Condon factors, like specific spectroscopy yeah. problems, very very quickly, and can be used for that. And and that's definitely a very very interesting area of research. I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to fathom a guess as to how far this all is away. I'm afraid. <laughs> that's fair enough that's fair enough yeah oh 
when Colin back is, yeah, no <laughs> Um so um another question. So in your talk you mainly uh were saying about uh the quantum chemistry and some theoretical chemistry uh size, but uh do you know of any other sort of uh business applications because um there's you know work in quantum cryptography, uh maybe even like stock picking and finance i've seen some people have been you know thinking about so what do you think about those areas of research and you think that they're, they're soon or they're a bit further away you think there's a lot of hype around it or uh, yeah i certainly believe that the first commercially relevant application area that we will see is in quantum chemistry for all the reasons that I said. Um, there are sort of NISC uh, era algorithms for optimization. Uh, one of them is called quantum uh, QAOA, quantum approximate optimization algorithm. So so um, so algorithms that that sort of allow you to have kind of low depth circuits and, and um, algorithms that could potentially be done on a on a NISC device. However, the problem is if you want to do optimization, usually what you're interested in is big data sets, right? <laughs> Lots mm -hmm. of data. Um, so so um, rather than, you know, small cases. Um, and um, so in order to, you know, consider big data on quant or like many data points on quantum computers, again, you will need bigger quantum computers. So I mean, hand wavily, uh, that, that is sort of the reason why I think uh, chemistry will be earlier um, because in chemistry you really have quite small problems that are really really hard to to do on quantum computers and in particular sort of multi-references multi-reference cases where you have degeneracies mm. fair enough fair enough um actually uh, i guess what one thing on that uh, do you do you think currently there's a bit of overhype in the quantum computers because I know some people are like oh quantum computers they're gonna they're gonna change the world you know we're gonna live on the moon and stuff like that uh yeah, yeah. I mean I guess I don't want to shoot myself in the foot here right true true, true. <laughs> but I do yeah I mean I do realize that and saying the question but do you think uh oh let's put it this way it's fine, it's fine. I can answer. I can answer. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously, um, we need to be we need to be very honest as a community as to what mm. quantum computers can and cannot do, um, and we also need to be honest as to what how difficult right the technical challenges are that we need to solve for them to do anything useful. Um, so uh, you know, while I think they're really going to change the world eventually <laughs> yeah. it's a bit off um and uh, and we need to you know we as a community need to be honest um and yes probably there is a bit too much you know hype generally speaking uh, but obviously we're sort of benefiting from it <laughs> too, too so much. i shouldn't complain <laughs> uh. Good answer, good answer. I mean, I can't imagine that's going to particularly affect your share prices. So, yeah. <laughs> that's all good. <laughs> we have one, but yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, any questions on YouTube? Got all those. Uh, on YouTube as well. Cool. Um, what else do we have? Um, those are the major questions. Um, do you think, like, how how realistic is it that uh, you think the quantum Moore's law will sort of hold up? Do you think actually we might exceed it in the future, or we might sort of fall behind? Or that's a very good question. I actually think that um, we might accelerate. And that is actually due to, to a certain extent, to the hype, to the money that is pouring into to quantum computing, to the quantum computing space, right? There's lots of money, there's lots of great ideas. And now there's also sort of professional grade engineering. For a long time, it was physicists in the lab, you know, uh, working on the on the fundamental questions. And mm. now it's armies and armies of engineers. Um, and we're seeing sort of that inflection point at the moment that it, you know, is becoming more of an engineering activity. And that is not to belittle any of the problems. They're still huge, right? That the technological mm 
challenges. But um, but so uh, given that, I have high hopes. So I would be very disappointed uh, mm. if it didn't accelerate. 